Tonight, the announcement no one on earth saw coming. Benedict the 16th becomes the first pope in six centuries to resign. Alan Pizzi is in Vatican City with what happens now. Mark Phillips on who might be next. Tensions are high after reported sightings of the most wanted man in California. Bill Whitaker reports on the dragnet. We now know what a massive tornado left behind in Mississippi. That is big. While in New England, they're counting the losses from the record blizzard. And Clint Romache receives the Medal of Honor. He tells David Martin how he earned the highest award for valor. The citation says there were 400 enemy soldiers. And we had 52 great Americans. Didn't seem fair to them. This is the CBS Evening News with Scott Pelley. Good evening. When the news got out today, Catholics all over the world were asking whether they had heard correctly. Something that just doesn't happen, just did. A pope resigned. Benedict XVI, 85 years old and frail, told a meeting of cardinals today he no longer has the physical and mental strength to carry out his responsibilities. On February 28th, he will become the first pope to step down since the 15th century, leaving the church in search of a new leader. We have a team of correspondents covering this historic day and the future of the Catholic Church, beginning with Alan Pizzi in Vatican City. The surprise announcement was delivered to a gathering of cardinals in Latin. Citing his age, Pope Benedict said that to do his work, both strength of mind and body are necessary, and that his have deteriorated to the extent that I have had to recognize my incapacity to fulfill the ministry entrusted to me. Vatican sources said the Pope had been considering his resignation for some time, but the clerics who heard it were still taken by surprise, according to Bishop Oscar Sanchez Val. We were all stunned, he said. All the cardinals looked at each other, and that was it. We asked for a last blessing. But perhaps they should have seen it coming. Benedict has been in failing health for some time, and had previously said he would consider resigning if he felt he could no longer carry on. But Vatican officials said no specific medical condition prompted the resignation. Vatican spokesman Father Federico Lombardi said the Pope had acted with what he called great freedom and clarity. We will continue to love him and to receive uh, his, his love. Benedict was one of the oldest popes to be elected at the age of 78 in 2005, and he had to cope with crises that included the priest sex abuse scandals and the theft of documents from his desk by his trusted butler. The last pope to resign was Gregory XII, 600 years ago. Benedict cannot participate in the conclave to choose his successor, which won't begin until the end of the second week of March at the earliest. He will probably live the rest of his life in a congregation for cloistered nuns inside Vatican City. Scott? Alan Pizzi with St. Peter's behind you. Alan, thanks very much. Conclave in Latin means with key. The cardinals of the church will meet behind the locked doors of the Sistine Chapel to elect a pope. The Vatican hopes to have a successor to Benedict in place by Easter. Any male Catholic can be elected pope, but traditionally the cardinals choose one of their own, a cardinal. We asked Mark Phillips, who's in the running? For the princes of the church, the cardinals, the sudden resignation of a pope can be more of a shock than the death of one and it is they who have to choose the next one. According to retired American Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, the church will now be looking for a new pope with a combination of the qualities it liked in the last two. I think they'll be, they'll be looking for men who, who would have some of the wisdom of, uh, of, of Pope Benedict and, and some of the charism of, uh, of Pope John Paul II. In the murky world of Vatican politics, no clear front runner to replace Benedict has emerged. A church which has come to see its future more and more in the developing world will have to decide whether its next leader should be from there. 
Cardinal Peter Turkson of Ghana is a campaigner for social reform and is often cited as the leading African candidate. But the 64-year-old has already stumbled on the issue of the church's relations with Islam and is seen as a risky choice. The highest profile potential candidate from Latin America may be the 63-year-old Archbishop of Sao Paulo, Brazil, Cardinal Adilio Pedro Scherer. But the church is yet to demonstrate it's ready for a South American Pope, and he's thought to be a long shot. There are long odds as well for Cardinal Timothy Dolan, Archbishop of New York. But any American candidate would have to overcome the church's traditional reluctance to elect a superpower Pope. If the church reverts to an Italian, Cardinal Angela Scola, 71-year-old Archbishop of Milan, is a popular figure, but the choice will likely have to do more with the approach to the issues than to geography. It's a complicated world that the, the Holy Father, the new Holy Father faces, as it was that the, the last two Holy Fathers have faced, but the complications do not ease up. They seem to multiply. And the choice the church is facing this time are the same ones that it faced eight years ago when it chose Cardinal Ratzinger then. Uh, then he appeared to be the heir apparent. This time, Scott, there isn't one. Mark, thank you very much. Mark just mentioned Cardinal Timothy Dolan, the Archbishop of New York. He sat down with us earlier today. Were you surprised this morning? Was I ever startled? Yes, I was. What's next? This hasn't happened in nearly six centuries. This hasn't years. happened in six centuries, has it? Now, we know what happens when a pope dies. Whether the same protocol will click in, I don't know. I'll be waiting to, to see. I would presume what would happen is that the College of Cardinals would be summoned to Rome uh, to be there for March 1st because once this, the chair is vacant, by church law, the College of Cardinals would, be, would, be, would oversee the day-in, day-out pastoral leadership and governance of the Church Universal. Uh, the Pope was very conservative mm -hmm. in a doctrinal sort of way. Mm -hmm. When a lot of American Catholics are looking for a Pope to lead into a new era, maybe for women in the Church, mm -hmm. for example. <clears throat> yeah, now you have to realize, Scott, that the job description of the Pope is to conserve. <laughs> you know, to conserve the patrimony of the faith. So it shouldn't surprise us, of course, that a pope would be, would be conservative in the best sense of the word. Would you expect that College of Cardinals to give us a pope very similar to the man who appointed them and elected him? I think uh, Catholics in general, and certainly the College of Cardinals, would look for a man who's able to articulate the truths of the faith with, with uh, in a compelling way, in a compelling, credible way, a man of deep piety, a man who knows the, the church universal and the needs of the people throughout the world, uh, those would be some of the things I think that, that, that people would look for. You're and Benedict XVI had that. Cardinal Timothy Dolan. In 2008, during a visit to the United States, Pope Benedict XVI did something unprecedented. In a closed meeting in Washington, D.C., he met members of the church who had been sexually abused at the hands of priests. Seth Doan met with one of those people, the people in that meeting, today. I remember looking out these stained glass windows going, God help me, what's, this isn't happening, while he was fondling and grabbing me. You were just 11 at the time. Yeah. Bernie McDade says he was sexually abused by a priest when he was an altar boy at St. James in Salem, Massachusetts. Quite frankly, I was brought up as a Catholic to think that these people were good, good in nature. And all I've been surrounded by is deception. Investigating sex abuse was among the assignments for then Cardinal Ratzinger during his more than 20 years in the Vatican office that deals with church discipline but he was criticized for not moving quickly to defrock priests who molested children. But as Pope, Benedict apologized publicly to victims. Above all, I express my deep sorrow to the innocent victims of these inspicable crimes. He was the first Pope to meet with victims, including Bernie McDade. He wouldn't talk to me. He would look down and go, yes, 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 my son, and that was it. He wouldn't engage me. And I realized after the meeting that he was there on a spiritual level to show the world that, hey, I apologized. What did you hope to get out of your meeting with the Pope? I want them to apologize and not just say the words. I want action after the fact. That's never happened. 
never happened. In recent years, the church has expedited its removal of abusive priests. But Scott, it has not moved to punish the bishops responsible for protecting those priests by moving them from church to church. Seth, thank you very much. Tonight, that massive manhunt continues in Southern California. The police are searching for a fired Los Angeles cop who's accused of seeking revenge by targeting officers and their families. He's suspected of killing three people. Bill Whitaker gets us up to date on the search. It's the biggest manhunt ever in Southern California and the biggest reward, $1 million. More than 600 clues about fugitive ex-cop Christopher Dorner have poured in. But Dorner continues to elude police. Today, Riverside, California DA Paul Zellerbach filed first-degree murder charges against Dorner for the slaying of a city police officer Thursday. This individual, by both his words and conduct, has made it very clear to all of us that every law enforcement officer in Southern California is in danger of being shot or killed. The area around the resort town of Big Bear, east of L.A., remains the primary focus of the search. Dorner's burned-out pickup truck was found near here Thursday. Since then, his trail has grown cold. Back in Los Angeles, 50 protection details are guarding Dorner's possible targets. L.A. Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. We will find him. Uh, we'll find them because we're putting uh, all of our resources uh, to do it. Uh, and I think it'll happen sooner rather than later. In an online rant, Dorner pledged revenge against those he says were responsible for his being fired from the LAPD. Dorner claims he was wrongly dismissed when he complained his training officer had used excessive force. Chief Charlie Beck says he's reopening the case. This investigation has been reviewed at, at multiple points. And I'll look at it again because not, a, not to appease him, but to make sure that the community understands that we're transparent and we value fairness. Scott, here at the LAPD, the tactical alert has been called off, which means that the officers have returned to their regular schedules. But police say that doesn't mean that they have let down their guards. They say they believe Dorner will strike again if given the chance. Bill, thank you. A Senate committee is scheduled to vote tomorrow on the nomination of Chuck Hagel to be Secretary of Defense. Hagel is a Republican, but he's been drawing a lot of criticism from Senate Republicans. In an interview tomorrow on CBS This Morning, former Republican Vice President Dick Cheney will join the chorus. My guess is, if you look at what the president's motives are for picking Chuck Hagel, I think he wants a Republican to go be the... the foil, if you will, for what he wants to do to the Defense Department, which is, I think, do serious, serious damage to our military capabilities. Vice President Cheney spoke with Charlie Rose, and you can see their interview first thing tomorrow on CBS This Morning. The man known as America's top military sniper was remembered at a memorial today. Millions took a dip, dip in the Ganges, repeating an ancient ritual. And two days after the blizzard, some are asking, where's the plow? When the CBS Evening News continues. By one estimate, 30 million people attended a Hindu pilgrimage yesterday in India, making it possibly the largest single gathering in human history. They went to swim in the Ganges River, an act of faith that dates back hundreds of years. Our Holly Williams was there. It was just after dawn when the Hindu holy man charged forward into the Ganges. The river they believe is a goddess who can wash away their sins. They've waited for this moment for 12 years since the last Priya Kumela. Hinduism's biggest, most joyful festival. In a two-month-long celebration, this day is considered the luckiest to take a dip. Saryu Das is a holy man who came here to collect a bottle of sacred water. How do you feel after swimming in the Ganges? This is our heritage, he told us. The mother Ganges has given us her blessings since the beginning of time. Then came the pilgrims. 
A flood of humanity, not driven by war or hunger, but moved by a shared faith. They've gathered here from all over India, camped out in a giant city of tents, in a carnival atmosphere. This country is modernizing fast, but Hindus are still rooted in an ancient religion. It's like an electric current. Lakshmi Singh Takari comes from a wealthy no. Indian family, but it's gave up nearly all of her material energy. possessions yes, to study of... with holy men. Uh, Maharaj is sitting here, he thinks he's a king. You know, he's got nothing, he's a fakir, but he's a king in his thought. On the banks of the Ganges, the crowd's religious fervor became increasingly chaotic. At times, this has come dangerously close to being a stampede, as the pilgrims have rushed forward, wave after wave, towards the water. Later in the day came the news that there was a stampede, as pilgrims left the Kumela and tried to board a train. At least 30 people were crushed to death. Hindus have been coming together for the Kumela for more than 2,000 years. But now the crowds are growing bigger, and this time that proved deadly. Holly Williams, CBS News, Priyag, India. We'll show you what happened when a tornado ripped through a college town when we come back. A tornado tore through 75 miles of Mississippi last night. Oh my God, I've never seen a tornado before in my life. He's seen one now. Amateur video captured the funnel in Hattiesburg, the home of Southern Mississippi University. There was damage on the campus, plenty of it, but most of the students were on break. Statewide, 200 homes were damaged, 60 people were hurt, but no one was killed. The Northeast is digging out after that weekend blizzard. Heavy rain today added to the mess. This is Hartford, Connecticut, where nearly two and a half feet of snow fell. The people on this block saw a plow for the first time this morning, two days after the storm. The Nor'easter is blamed for at least 17 deaths. More than 128,000 homes and businesses are still without power, most of them in Massachusetts. In Texas today, so many people wanted to attend a memorial service for ex-Navy SEAL Chris Kyle that it was held at the Dallas Cowboys football stadium. His casket was placed on the 50-yard line. Kyle was a sniper and was said to have killed more than 150 of the enemy in Iraq, a record. He was shot to death last week at a shooting range in Texas allegedly by another Iraq veteran whom Kyle was trying to help through his struggles with post-traumatic stress. Another hero was at the White House today. We'll tell you what he did to earn the nation's highest military honor next. Today, President Obama awarded the Medal of Honor to former Army Staff Sergeant Clinton Romache. In 2009, with U.S. forces in eastern Afghanistan under Taliban attack, a wounded Romache ducked enemy fire to rescue other wounded soldiers and recover bodies of the fallen. David Martin spoke to Romache about the battle. You have to see combat outpost Keating to realize just how indefensible it was to an attack from these Taliban fighters. Just 52 American soldiers were down there, plus Staff Sergeant Cliff Romache. We were taking everything from, you know, very precise sniper fire, um, automatic weapon fire, machine gun positions. Uh, we're taking mortar and indirect fire, RPG fire. And where was it coming from? All 360 degrees around us. It was just from every high point. Were you taking casualties? We had taken uh, casualties from the, the first barrage of fire that came in and then continued to take them throughout the, the remainder of the, the firefight. A recreation of the battle shows Romache was everywhere that day, running across open ground to reinforce one weak point after another. At one point, I'd witnessed uh, three enemy fighters just walk straight through our front gate like they owned the place. You know, and to, and to see that, you know, it's just 
unreal for a second. But, you know, that's, that's ours, you know. We're not going to let them do that. How close do you think, in retrospect, you came to being overrun? Almost as close as you can get without being it. Although hit in the side by shrapnel from a rocket-propelled grenade, Romache was determined to do more than just survive. We weren't going to be beat that day, and we were going to we were going to take it back. But they were up against 300 enemy fighters, and we had 52 great Americans. Didn't seem fair to them. Airstrikes finally broke the enemy assault. Afterwards, bullet-riddled Humvees and burned-out buildings showed the kind of fire he and his men had braved. We ended up uh, losing eight brave, eight brave soldiers that day. Three days later, the Americans left Keating for good. Does it feel like you won, or what does it feel like? It's hard to say you, you win or lose, but to know we to, to know we just had so many great soldiers there that, that stood proud and, and did their job, you know, that's just an amazing thing to, to witness. What was gained that day? Nothing. What did Clint Romache and his men achieve? Everything. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon. And that's the CBS Evening News for tonight. For all of us at CBS News all around the world, good night.